Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Armagan Al Haq. I'm the manager of Program Development Partnerships and Finance with the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. And uh, it's an honor for me uh, to introduce our guest speaker for today, Professor Maurice Dusso. He is a prof of geological engineering in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department at University of Waterloo. He has spent three years as a roughneck and drilling mud technician prior to completing his bachelor's undergrad degree in 1971 and PhD in 1977. From 1977 to 1982, he occupied a research professor chair at the University of Alberta funded by the Alberta Oil Sands Technology and Research Authority. During this period, he developed novel skills and broad experience in new production technologies and drilling rock mechanics. In 1982, he became chairman of the Geological Engineering Program at Waterloo and was director of the Porous Media Research Institute from 1995 to 2000. Maurice carries out research in petroleum geomechanics that includes drilling, hydraulic fracturing, reservoir geomechanics, and is the recognized world expert in new production methods, deep waste sequestration in sedimentary basins, and reservoir geomechanics. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Maurice Dusso. Thank you. Actually, that's such an old piece of paper that you have there. I don't do those things anymore. My it's okay. <laughs> I've uh, actually, in the last 10, 12 years, uh, moved quite strongly over to things like energy storage, uh, one aspect of which I'll talk about today, or uh, geothermal energy and trying to integrate different energy uh, systems together constructively to make use of, uh, of, of energy in more intelligent and efficient ways. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit like a political campaign speech. Okay? So the first thing you do in a political campaign speech is you try to set the, set the basis, and then you have to knock down your opponents. Okay? So I'm going to try to be very disrespectful about the other uh, energy uh, storage systems that claim to be amenable for large-scale grid-scale use. All right? and then once I've torn down my opponents completely, then I'll present my platform. And my platform is, that, uh, uh, is based upon my uh, enthusiasm for compressed air energy storage. So think of me as a political candidate and my name is Case. All right? Because I'm going to ask you to vote for Case. So let's start. Well, this is a uh, map of warm days in the United States in the 20 years from uh, 1991 to 2010. And you can see down there, I have a friend of mine from Laurentian University who has a house in Phoenix, and he does not stay there in the summer. He comes back to Ramsey Lake up in Sudbury where he spends his summers on a cottage on the lake and goes down to Phoenix in the winter. And you can see why, because they have so many hot days in the June, July, August, September period. Well, things are getting warmer. Uh, despite the fact that some people don't really believe it or have different agendas. So yesterday in our Globe and Mail, the uh, Trump uh, administration announced its withdrawal from the uh, Paris Climate Accords, making it, I believe, the only country in the world that has withdrawn. Okay. Of course, they announced that a year and a half ago that they intended to withdraw. But today, yesterday, was the day that they could legally withdraw. So they did. They did. Well, given that, we can expect uh, the future maybe to look a little bit warmer. Mm. Yeah. And maybe a lot warmer if things don't change, okay? But remember, about the most stupid thing that any scientist or technologist can say is, if things remain as they are, because they never do, okay? They never do. Nevertheless, these somewhat specious projections of temperature uh, in the future suggest that the United States will be somewhat of an inferno in about 90 years if we uh, don't change. So clearly, we're going to change. And the major elements are the following the decarbonization of energy because of the greenhouse effect associated with carbon dioxide. I do remind you, however, that carbon dioxide is not the only contributor to green, to, pardon me, to global warming. There are 
other issues such as water vapor in the air, uh, methane emissions from cattle, uh, methane emissions from uh, the uh, oil and gas and coal mining industry, and from landfills, that organic garbage that you put out there in the landfill here on Herb Street, a lot of it turns into methane that gets into the air. So uh, we need more renewables as well. That's pretty well agreed upon by anyone who's in the energy business these days. We need more electricity if we're going to get off of carbon-based fuels because the major source of greenhouse emissions from carbon-based fuels, from fossil fuels rather, is the transportation sector. In order to get to there, wherever there is, from here, we're going to have to come to grips with energy storage at a large scale, maybe at a small scale. So I'll talk about gigawatt to megawatt scale energy storage uh, power output uh, using compressed air energy storage. And of course, this ties in very well with wind, and you'll soon see why. Uh, the cost of wind power that, uh, that are dropping all around the world uh, have now become lower than the cost of power generation from coal, natural gas, combined cycle turbines, or nuclear power, pretty well everywhere in the world. And they will continue to drop somewhat. Um, three cents per kilowatt hour, Canadian cents per kilowatt hour seems reasonable. Already, last December, in the bidding for uh, re energy contracts in Alberta, I believe that some of the supplier, the one supplier uh, bid in at 4.1 cents per kilowatt hour of provided power. And offshore wind is wonderful for wind power much better than onshore because onshore we have land use issues, we have more turbulence, we have people that live nearby, etc. But offshore wind power is, re and you're going to see why I mention offshore wind power in a few minutes. However, wind power is not very dispatchable because it occurs when it occurs, not when you want it. So if it's, if it's very calm outside at 5 p.m. and you want to turn on your electrical kettle, hmm, not much wind power is helping you to do that. So we need something better than just renewables. We need stable, reliable uh, power that's robust in terms of its voltage, in terms of its uh, uh, frequency, because we want to run all of these machines and all of these devices that we have nowadays on electrical power, so it has to be very high quality. So typically, in a day, a grid will respond to morning and afternoon demands uh, and be in a position of baseload deficiency during the day because demand exceeds uh, the baseload supply, and somewhat in a surplus uh, in the night when baseload is providing electricity at a rate that is higher than the demand at that time. And what does wind power look like? Not very good. Wind power is variable, it's intermittent, it's irregular, and it's really crappy power. In order to factor it into a large-scale grid, we need to take crappy power and turn it into quality power. And that's where compressed air energy storage has a very singular and powerful role to play. The variability of wind power occurs on the scales of seconds to, to, well, to weeks or to days. Uh, of course, if you have 10,000 turbines distributed over a very wide geographical area, the combined effect of all of these is somewhat smoother. But nonetheless, the wind may not blow so much tomorrow, or a very sharp wind front will come through on a cold, uh, pardon me, on an ca otherwise calm day, causing uh, fluctuations. So these are difficult to cope with. Well, if we want to replace fossil fuels, which is one of those bullets at the beginning of the presentation to try to keep greenhouse effects down, decarbonization, we're going to have to do some things, okay? And there are many options. For example, uh, we could say, hey, let's do more hydro. But that's not as uh, simple as it used to be. Already, Quebec is talking about the next generation in the James Bay and James Bay North 
uh, hydro generation and already the First Nations groups there are saying that this is just not going to happen. So it turns out that all the valleys that they want to flood are the lowlands where there's game and higher speciation, denser vegetation, denser growth. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a matter of accommodating some very, very divergent needs. In the south, we're not going to build any more dams. In fact, in the United States, there has been a very slow and small but regular diminishing of hydropower as old dams are taken down and the run of the river is try, uh, the attempt to reestablish the run of the river as it was at some time in the past for ecological and purposes and for enjoyment purposes. Nuclear, nuclear is base load. Hydropower can vary over a period of minutes quite easily, but nuclear and coal, of course, we're not going to talk about coal, but nuclear can't. Nuclear is fairly steady minute by minute. You can turn it off on a weekly basis, but you can't turn it off on a minute or hourly basis. Uh, many of us, I think I probably belong in this category, many of us believe that in the energy world of the future where we need a lot more electricity, nuclear is going to have a comeback or something is going to have to occur to give us a larger component of baseload uh, as, because we just don't have the ability to build a whole bunch more hydro. We just can't do that. More natural gas, but natural gas is a fossil fuel. It's much better than coal. Natural gas will give you twice the kilowatt hours per carbon molecule, or let me rephrase that, per carbon dioxide molecule. So twice as good as coal, and you don't have tailings ponds, and you don't have mines, and you don't have transportation issues. It's really great compared to coal, but it still is a fossil fuel. So it will produce, as I said, about half of the CO2 per kilowatt hour. But by the way, if we marry compressed air energy storage with, carbon dio uh, with uh, methane uh, natural gas generation, it cuts it down to not 50%, but 30%. We can actually generate electricity with natural gas at 30% of the carbon dioxide output of coal if we marry it with compressed air energy storage. And compressed air energy storage, by the way, has many, many potential good relationships like the one I just mentioned. Uh, I won't go into more details, but a colleague of mine in, uh, in Iran uh, has developed a very interesting concept of using the heat of compression from compressed air energy storage to distill water from seawater in a hot, dry climate. And it's quite remarkable the number of liters per minute that can be generated with the waste heat of compression from compressed air. Geothermal, but geothermal is still in very early days and we have uh, uh, no commercialized, commercial projects for deep geothermal in Canada at this time, although one or two are on their way. And of course, magic solutions. And magic solutions are rife on the internet uh, and unfortunately seem to be fairly common in political circles as well. You know, everybody knows that we can be 100% off of fossil fuels by 2030. Uh, I won't say who, uh, who said that on television, on CBC here a few months ago, but no, everybody does not know that. The cost and the impact of decarbonizing in 11 years is pretty huge. It's pretty huge, given the infrastructure. So everybody says, well, we have to bump up renewables. And because of the irregular and variable nature of that power, we need energy storage. So let's look at energy storage. So this is the amount of power that you can put out, OK? How many light bulbs that you can keep burning? That's on the bottom axis. The vertical axis is how fast can you change, can you meet the demand? In a millisecond, supercapacitors and superconducting magnetic energy storage can have responses of milliseconds. So they're very good for small scale uh, adjustments on the web, uh, pardon me, on the grid, but not so good for providing grid scale power, okay? Because on the grid here in Ontario, we're talking about gigawatts. We're not talking about kilowatts, okay? So that's six orders of magnitude larger and then some. So, for the grid scale storage, we're looking in the upper right hand corner. Batteries, flow batteries, I 
put big letters there to draw it to your attention. The other options are uh, hydro, power to hydrogen to power, or compressed air energy storage. And I've drawn compressed air energy storage with a wide bar because apparently it has quite a bit of flexibility in terms of scale. To understand a little bit more about energy storage now, we have to look at the energy density and storage. And we learned some really hard lessons from this graph. Really hard lessons. Uh, first of all, let's look at the fossil fuels. There's diesel, fuel, and gasoline here. And uh, there's some other things, but mainly diesel, fuel, and gasoline. And they have uh, you know, something like 45, 48 megajoules per kilogram. But they have a lot of megajoules per liter. So in other words, I can get a lot of energy into a liter. Okay? A lot of energy into a liter. Natural gas, much less energy into a liter because it's a gas. So if it's uncompressed, it's way down just above the axis here. If it's compressed to 25 megapascals, it's here, but it's still a very small fraction, like 20% of the energy density of gasoline just sitting in, a, in your gas tank. Hydrogen, which has a remarkably high potential energy provision per kilogram, is so, so hard to compress that even liquid hydrogen is about the same energy density per liter as methane. And hydrogen that is just simply compressed is at 70 megapascals, that's three times as much, has half of the power output, or pardon me, the energy rather, of methane. So that means that these kinds of energy storage systems have different flexibilities. For hydrogen, I need huge amounts of storage. For diesel fuel, not so much. Methanol, I put it here because it is possible to make hydrogen, turn it into methanol, that's a very well known reaction. And we have a fuel that is not nearly as good as diesel or, or, or gasoline in terms of storage, but the nice thing about methanol is that I can use methanol in a Ballard fuel cell. I can put it through a reformer and it reforms into hydrogen and carbon dioxide and the hydrogen goes through the fuel cell and generates power without, uh, without any pollution, of course, depending where the carbon molecule came from, carbon atom. Unfortunately, all of those four forms of grid-scale energy storage that I described to you have a remarkably low energy density. They're way, way down there at the origin of this plot. The four, again, to repeat, are pumped hydro, compressed air energy storage, batteries, and uh, heat storage in rocks. Uh, the only one that's a little bit better is hydrogen storage, which would be in, in this range uh, right, right here. Hydrogen has a lot of energy when you, when you use it uh, properly. So grid-scale energy storage approaches generally have low, low mass and volumetric energy content. Okay? And this also gives you another constraint. If you're investing a few million dollars into compressed air energy storage, you can't say, well, I'm going to just store that energy for six months. No. There's so little energy in that that you have to use it as frequently as possible. A good analogy might be that you own a taxi. And you say, well, I, uh, I'm only going to accept uh, two rides a month. Well, sorry, not good for business. You're going to have to try to get that capital cost of your taxi paid for by many more rides a month than that. It's the same thing with compressed air energy storage, pumped hydro. Uh, you have to use them over and over again frequently. Energy density gives certain problems. So for example, uh, there have been many suggestions that we can somehow or other trap the methane from ruminants. And by the way, I, I point out that most of the methane comes out the front end. Cows burp a lot. Okay? 
Well, the problem you can see is the tank. For one day, you have to have an 800 liter tank because methane is so low density, which leads to, of course, the kind of images of surface density, a surface tank storage that we see around the world for natural gas in areas that don't have the right geological conditions. If you have the right geological conditions, salt caverns, saline aquifers, or porous media uh, depleted aquifers, or sorry, that's actually depleted oil and ga uh, depleted gas fields. Uh, okay, so we can use these uh, types of facilities to give us energy density. And at the same pressure, roughly, methane has about 60 times the uh, at about 10 megapascals, actually. Methane has about the 60 times the energy density of compressed air. So I can store methane on a year-to-year -year basis, and we do that here in Ontario. The Don facility, uh, not, too, not too far out of Sarnia, uh, is the Canada's largest underground gas storage system, and they use uh, an array of about 25 or 26 old uh, reefs that used to contain natural gas at one time. Uh, these are just the pipes that you see coming out of the ground. And the Dawn facility is that uh, yellow dot there, Dawn Hub. And I do want to point out that uh, 10 years ago, all of the natural gas that came into Dawn came from Alberta and Saskatchewan and British Columbia. Now the majority of it comes from Ohio, okay, because of the shale gas production in Ohio, and some from Pennsylvania. So. What does storage mean? Well, most people think of storage, uh, energy storage, oh, the Energizer Bunny, that's energy storage, okay? Lasts forever, right? Well, not quite. Realistically, for the grid, we need huge batteries. Okay, this is an array of batteries in Australia, tied into a solar, a solar energy farm. Australia is moving rapidly towards solar energy. If you walk along the uh, ion uh, tracks, which you're not permitted to do, but close by, every so often you'll see a box. What's that box? Well, that box is actually batteries, because when the ion wants to accelerate rapidly out of a stop, they can't draw down the energy from the grid at will. They have to have another energy source that allows them to accelerate, and then some of that energy goes back into that energy, into the battery, some of it, because you're always losing energy, of course, uh, as they decelerate. And of course, the batteries are continuously recharged from the grid. But we have issues with batteries. They're chemical. Uh, they require uh, lithium, cobalt, uh, and a number of rare earths uh, in order to uh, make, make them uh, very, very efficient. Uh, there are some static risks of fire or breaching of batteries or the risks in the construction phases. Lifespan issues, the lithium ion batteries that Elon Musk is promoting for grid scale storage have a lifespan of about seven years, depending on the number of dis discharge cycles and the depth of the discharge, of course. Uh, a question that nobody seems to want to ask is how are we going to recycle these huge numbers of batteries when Ontario has five million electrical vehicles and a grid where we're using batteries for storage everywhere? That is perhaps the elephant in the room. Uh, the cost per kilowatt hour has dropped dramatically, and we've seen recently a whole bunch of specious extrapolations. People saying, oh, look at that, look at that, the curve is going down. Be careful on extrapolations. Be very careful. When I was, uh, when I was uh, 30 years old and I started as an academic, in the first two years, uh, three years, I guess, I got really good pay raises from the University of Alberta. They really, really were very, very generous to me. And if I had taken those three years' pay raises and extrapolated, extrapolated them linearly, I'd be making $680,000 a year now. So be careful with your extrapolations. Battery cost per kilowatt hour has been slowing down quite dramatically in the last three years because we're reaching the end of the chemical potential ability of lithium ion. And we do not have a clear successor yet. And batteries remain four times more expensive per kilowatt hour than pumped hydro or compressed air energy storage. So 
Another possibility, pumped hydro. The world's largest pumped hydro uh, station is here, Sir Adam Beck, in uh, Ontario here. And it's only 40 megawatts that it, of energy that it puts out, supplementary energy. And you say, holy, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of dam. Well, this is not just pumped hydro. This is the power station for pumped hydro and part of the Niagara River. So, but yes, it's a lot of, it's a lot of dam and not that much energy from pumped hydro, uh, supplementary energy. And that's because there's not that much energy in a kilogram of water raised up 40 meters. You let it drop and you can figure out the energy and it's not great. But good thing about pumped hydro, it's probably 90% efficient in terms of the full cycle. That's pretty good. But flooding populated areas is not going to happen anymore in Southern Ontario, uh, only distant sites are available. That, hang on, that's still not bad. For example, if our grid here in Ontario were tied in closely with the Quebec hydro grid, then the hydro dams in northern Quebec actually will serve as proxy energy storage systems. In other words, we could use wind power when we have it and not use hydro and save the hydro for when we don't have the wind. But of course, Quebec doesn't want to do that. Quebec wants to sell its power to the United States. And no federal government will ever tell them otherwise, I assure you of that. Strange country we have. Water availability and evaporation. If you want to do uh, pumped hydro storage in Australia, it's a bit of a different story. Okay? There's about one site in Australia, well that's not true, there's a few, but there are very few sites in Australia where pumped hydro actually will give you what you need over the period of a year because of drought, rainfall, and water availability. Environmental issues with water courses, uh, but there are some advantages, uh, very small greenhouse gas emissions, pretty efficient, uh, high capital cost, but it's only 20 to 30 percent of the cost of battery storage, well understood technology. Power to hydrogen to power, all right, so we take renewable energy, do electrolysis, distribute, and run fuel cell cars and power uh, with, with hydrogen or with some fuel made from hydrogen, like methanol, for example, okay? Some of the issues. Full cycle efficiency for power to hydrogen to power is only 40%. Mind you, a lot of that is waste heat, and if you can find a way to use the waste heat, then, hmm, the whole cycle will become more efficient. It is, oops, sorry, notoriously difficult to store. Uh, because it's very, very large volumes needed and it's, and it's hard to compress. Uh, it's difficult to transport because it's got such small molecules that, that it leaks out of everything. Uh, so these are some of the issues. But in, in advantages, of course, it's completely non-polluting, maybe not cheap, and maybe in some cases where we desperately need to reduce uh, emissions like New Delhi, uh, we could potentially use it. And here's New Delhi yesterday, okay? Uh, just to put things into, into context. Well, of course, there's other options for New Delhi. Already, there are uh, subsidies for uh, natural gas, not subsidies, there are different tax rates for natural gas taxis and vehicles. That's not bad, that helps. Hydrogen vehicles is a possibility, but you could also have compressed air city cars. So Tata Engineering, Tata Motors in India, has been researching compressed air city cars for about 15 years. Nothing is available commercially and they're continuing to put off the announcing of a commercial uh, air car, but uh, we're talking cars that might have a range of 50 to 80 kilometers, not cars that are going to drive to Sudbury and back on one and a half tanks of gasoline. So let's move on now to the subject of the talk, which is compressed, compressed air energy storage, because now I've hopefully convinced you that not all energy storage systems are made the same. They all have their deficiencies and advantages. So compressed air energy storage is non-polluting, a uh, very small surface area because all of the storage is underground in geological media. Uh, Non-combustible and non-explosive, in contrast, say, to hydrogen or methane. Uh, 50 to 70 percent round-trip efficiency, depending if you recover the heat of compression or not or if you can use the heat of compression, like my colleague in uh, Iran that published a paper on distillation of water, distillation of seawater from the CAES 
uh, compression heat. It's scalable. Pumped hydro is scalable too, I suppose, but uh, compressed air energy storage is scalable from megawatts to, uh, to gigawatts. It integrates extremely well with renewables, and the cost is perhaps 25% the cost of batteries on a prorated kilowatt hour basis with today's interest rates, and so on. It's not new technology. This is the Huntdorf site that has been operating for 38 years. But conditions now with decarbonization needs and a lot of push for renewables and different costs of different things, like the very cheap cost of wind power, have conspired to get together to make it exceedingly favorable to use CAES for grid scale now. Okay, so let's look, look first of all at the large scale gigawatts. Now let's assume that we can only use large underground uh, uh, volumes to store uh, compressed air at the, giga at the gigawatt scale, at the grid scale, and that's probably true because when you start to get a pressure vessel on the surface, it's a bomb. It's a bomb. 70 cubic meters would be a vessel three meters in diameter and 11 meters long. And you'll see why I say 70 cubic meters later on. The pressures are set by the regulators, but subsurface, they're set by geological conditions. So at the surface, if you want to exceed 20 megapascals storage in a pressure vessel, you have to adhere to a set of regulatory constraints that are extremely, extremely expensive. You have to make those tanks remarkably robust and store them in a bunker uh, just in case they explode. All right, so the compressed air approach is that renewables, such as sun or wind, uh, will run a compressed air uh, system, a compressor, storing in a large volume geo repository from which we can extract the compressed air, pass it through a power device, and feed energy into the grid. I also have some air arrows there for heat storage uh, because good heat management can greatly improve the efficiency of any integrated energy system, but particularly compressed air energy storage. In principle, we can increase the energy effic the efficiency full cycle from about 53, 55% up to 72, 73% roughly. So that's the kind of efficiency gain from good heat management. Now in this power device here, I've drawn a natural gas turbine because that is what is used at Huntorf and at McIntosh in Alabama, the two large commercial sites for compressed air energy storage. There are other options. There are natural gas free options as well. So w without going into detail, I also want to point out that excess grid power at night can be used to compress air as well. So uh, the compressed air energy storage siting and size depends upon geology and grid dis disposition. So if I have a wonderful geology site up in the Arctic islands, I will never use it because there is not the uh, density of population up there that warrants a large-scale energy storage for, at a grid scale. On the other hand, down here in southern Canada, there are certain places, for example, Vancouver, and there is no good geological site anywhere near Vancouver that can be used to store large amounts of compressed air. So we are constrained by geology. No good aquifers in Quebec, for example, for uh, porous media storage like this. Uh, this is a, a, a porous medium that, uh, where we can uh, pump in compressed air, maybe horizontal wells, and then withdraw the compressed air uh, when we need it for power. This is not as good as a salt cavern. A salt cavern is much better because there are no real constraints on the flow rate. I mean, you can have huge mass, mass coming out of uh, wells with highly compressed air to drive your turbines. And we know how to do this. We know how to design salt caverns for compressed air. And some of these salt caverns for compressed air are being built as we speak in Texas uh, and in Germany. So there is a new generation of compressed air energy stations that are coming. And we build it by dissolving it. That's the nice thing about salt. We drill a borehole and we start circulating water appropriately. 
And as time goes on, we create a cavern of a desired shape and desired volume. How long does that take? Uh, two to three years for a 100,000 cubic meter vertical cavern, which would be a typical size. Okay. And then you have to get the system going on the front, on the top end. Now, the world's leader for that is Siemens, or which used to be called Dresser Rand, and they are the world's largest uh, producer and uh, of uh, what do we call rotary goods. In other words, things that turn like compressors and expanders. So this is just an example here of their compressor train uh, for their system. And of course, then there's storage underground. And then here is the expander train for their system. And their system is rated at 165 megawatts, so that's grid scale. Of course, I can have two, three, four, five, six of these side by side if I have sufficient volume of storage underground. So it can put out 165 megawatts of power to the grid or down as low as 130. That's about the range of output that, that they, they don't like going below 130 because efficiency starts dropping off pretty fast. But you, how long can I put out this amount of power? In other words, how many megawatt hours can I do? Well, that depends entirely on the volumes of caverns that you have. That's it. So if you want to have twice as long at that rate, You've got to have twice the volume of the caverns to store compressed air. Where is there salt in Canada? Well, that's it. It's quite limited. Quite limited. So I'm going to talk uh, very briefly, one slide only about Ontario, and a few slides about the Maritimes. So here in Ontario, and this is my one slide, the blue is the salt. We've got fabulous salt here in the Sarnia area in Lambton County. Just fabulous, okay? 700 meters deep. Thick enough to make a, not, not a vertical cavern, but kind of make a, a kind of a law, elongated rugby ball cavern, horizontal. Adequate size, 100,000 uh, cubic meters, not a problem. Okay. And we can make as many of them as you want. That salt bed is continuous in all directions. We can even do it underneath Lake Huron if you wish. And it so turns out that the best wind in all of southern, uh, all of Ontario and even most of Quebec, except for the James Bay area, the best wind is right there. It's on the Lake Huron coast because it's got a great big reach of water and the wind is very consistent, but a problem. All of those people that own beach cottages along there don't like to see windmills in the distance. In fact, they don't like to see windmills behind them on the hill either. These are issues that are beyond the, uh, sometimes beyond the uh, ability of us technical people to really grasp because we tend to value things in somewhat different ways than, on the other hand, I don't want a windmill in my backyard either, okay? To be honest. So there happens to be a remarkably fortuitous confluence of the best salt and the best wind right there. And of course, there's the Bruce Station is up there. Uh, Babylon on the lake is over here. And we are very close to other large energy users, Windsor, Detroit, and that all speaks to the great advantage of having a large-scale energy storage system in Sarnia, actually. The economics are tremendous, but companies and power companies are conservative. So it depends upon regional salt geology if you're using salt. And the Maritimes Basin has excellent salt, but even better, the Maritimes Basin has the best wind in Canada. Okay? So here's a map of the salt structures in the Maritimes Basin. There's some other salt structures here in uh, New Brunswick that I will mention in passing. So we've got all the salt structures that we need to create salt caverns all the way up to offshore Newfoundland, actually. Uh, the Madeline Islands, which is in the middle there, could become an energy powerhouse, quite literally, because they have fabulous salt, fabulous winds, and Quebec Hydro is going to be building a subsea power cable to the Madeline Islands. Now, of course, if we were rational Canadians, we would say, hmm, the shortest path is uh, through Prince Edward Island. Uh, well, no, of course, Quebec Hydro is going to build it from the Gaspé Peninsula, 210 kilometers instead of 90. This is what causes engineers to have another beer, you know, this kind of logic. But anyway. 
I don't make the political decisions, but I do know that it's the best wind in Canada because of the wonderful reaches in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Particularly favorable spots are offshore Prince Edward Island. By the way, did you know that Prince Edward Island is net zero? Because a lot of, there's a lot of wind farms on Prince Edward Island, and they are actually putting as much energy into the grid as they withdraw from the grid. So they say, we're net zero. Well, that's not quite fair, because when they are not generating wind power, they're sucking power from New Brunswick with coal-fired and oil-fired power stations. So they're net zero in terms of energy, maybe, but they're not net zero in terms of carbon dioxide, because they depend upon fossil fuels to get them through those times when the wind is not blowing. Because, you see, they have no energy storage. Energy storage is the key. So from the uh, shores of uh, Prince Edward Island to Sussex is about 300 kilometers. And it turns out that at Sussex, there's a fabulous salt structure that is very well understood because we've been mining potash in it for many, many decades. But the potash mines shut down about six, seven years ago. Okay. These circles, I spent a bit of time on the web looking at wind. Those circles are all the areas of fabulous wind, uh, uh, wind generation capability in the uh, southwest of the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence, southeast, sorry. And the Penobscot structure in New Brunswick is very centrally located. And you may not know this, but New Brunswick is already a significant exporter of power to the United States, into Maine. And there are reasons for that. Uh, and Maine uh, has no salt, no capacity for energy storage. And there's a lot of opposition to any hydro, and there's a lot of opposition to wind power in Maine. But the wind power in Maine is not nearly as good as the wind power in the northern shores of, and the northwest shores of Nova Scotia. It's just really quite tremendous. So where are we in Canada in terms of compressed air energy storage? Well, Goderich has a project that has been just initiated has been just opened, 1.75 megawatts demonstration project. I, I, I helped them with that. Alberta has a project on the books. Uh, it hasn't been started yet in terms of the caverns. Uh, I, I have spoken to the New Brunswick government about, uh, and, and I made a couple of trips to uh, Hydro, Hydro Quebec in Montreal to talk to them about uh, compressed air energy storage. But as I said, large energy companies are very, very conservative. Uh, Nova Scotia, I'm working with a professor there trying to see uh, if any leverage can be brought. Sarnia, we did a study in Sarnia, but again, got to have the right supporters for this. And just in the last six, eight weeks, Saskatchewan Power and, uh, and I and a couple of other people have been talking about the possibility. So green the Maritimes. You can actually green the Maritimes if you want. We could eliminate all of carbon-based, fossil-based fuel in the Maritimes in about 10 years, by my calculations, if their commitment was made to large-scale compressed air energy storage combined with wind power. That does not say you're going to eliminate all other sources of power. You'll still have Point Le Pro, a nuclear power plant. You'll still have small-scale hydro here and there. And you'll still have a few natural gas stations. Now, let's look at the, at the other scale. We were talking about hundreds of megawatts or gigawatts. Now, let's go down to the scale of megawatts. And I said to you that geology is constraining us in this large scale, gigawatt scale, or hundreds of megawatt scales for compressed air energy storage. Well, it turns out that if you can make a good pressure vessel, your geology becomes somewhat irrelevant. And here's a good pressure vessel. It's oil and gas technology. We drill a well bore, maybe 30 centimeters in the, is going to be the final diameter. So the well bore is maybe drilled to a diameter of uh, 38 centimeters, something like that. And we put in a steel casing and we cement it into place with a special cement that has 75% silica in it instead of cement powder. We, we've been doing this for a long time. It's called thermal cement. And we can operate uh, that as a pressure vessel. And we're no longer constrained by the worries that it might be a bomb. Because the worst that can happen if we have a breach is that we have a geyser of air. And it'll, it'll probably snow because when air goes from 30 megapascals or 20 megapascals down to 100 
pascal, uh, kilopascals, it gets so darn cold that it's going to cause snow. So the worst that it could cause probably is a snowstorm. Unless somebody is standing with their head over the steel when the breach happens. If a breach happens underground, you're going to be injecting some air into the subsurface with the consequences being relatively innocuous. So here are some numbers. And well bores of 750 to 1,500 meters deep are appropriate. Now remember I said 70 cubic meters was a 3 meter diameter, 11 meter long uh, cylinder on the surface. Well, 70 cubic meters is also a 1 kilometer deep well bore with 30 centimeters internal diameter. In other words, our pressure vessel is no longer sitting inside of a concrete bunker because it's a bomb. Our pressure vessel is underneath the ground. And furthermore, that pressure vessel can be heated up by, by some of the energy of compression, which turns out to be energetically really good. So now we have an array of well bores. And the same system is happening. Again, heat storage. I've added space heating, if we have a way of, uh, of uh, using some of the heat of compression. And instead of a turbine, a natural gas turbine, now I put in an air expander. This is a fuel-free air expander. But one thing I have to remember is that when I expand air, it gets very cold. And I can only expand air so much. So I have a lot of compressed air. So I, I expand it to this volume, and I get power out of it. But now it's very cold. So I have to heat it up to put it into the next, next expander. Otherwise, things are going to freeze. And then that'll kill my expanders. So I actually have to provide heat during the expansion stages. I may have two, three, four expansion stages, because there is no such thing as an expander that will take in air at 20 megapascals and put out air at atmospheric pressure. That does not exist. You have to go in a cascade. And these are connected through a rod all the way through the middle of these expanders. So they're operating on a common axis, uh, but at different power rates at different times. Uh, so remember, though, even though I don't emphasize it here, that heat management is important. And you know, I put this down here, other compressed air energy uses. You know, and Somebody said, why? Well, I still think the idea of air cars is kind of cool. Okay. Here's what a wellhead array might look like. This is a natural gas storage facility uh, in Louisiana, I believe. Uh, but basically, a compressed air energy storage facility would look uh, something like that at the wellheads. Uh, here's a typical power cycle. So we have compressor, compressors. Air is cooled because now the air is very hot. I may store that heat. I may use it. Here is the storage facility. Here is the energy recovery, where I'm showing you that I have a high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine, and I have to add some fuel. Well, it's not quite right to say fuel. I have to add heat. I have to add heat. And of course, when I add heat, that means I get the energy out of that heat too, because it's causing uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical energy, mechanical, OK. Uh, right, so this is a small scale commercial compressor that, uh, that gives you a certain pressure range. And in order to get higher than 1500 psi, you put another compressor in front of it. So you have a train of compressors that are staging your compression to reach the desired level. On the expansion side, similarly, you have a train of expanders, two, three, that, uh, are, uh, that are using heat in some way uh, to achieve a greater efficiency in your cycle. That's an air expander commercial system. Now, to throw you a bit of a curveball, what is Singapore going to do? Singapore has a higher standard of living than Canada and rising. They have no land, very dense population, no potential for hydro storage, no potential for hydropower, no potential for nuclear energy, uh, probably because of the opposition of the, uh, of the uh, citizens to have nuclear power stations, even offshore, uh, maybe on one of these islands. Uh, just n nobody wants nuclear power anymore for various reasons, although I think that's going to have to change. So they are really constrained 
And they, they depend upon the good graces of Malaysia to provide them with the necessary power. And they have, of course, natural gas generating stations and oil generating stations too. And they want to become green, okay? So they have a problem. What can Singapore do? Well, if you go on the web and start looking around, you're gonna find out that Singapore wants to make a whole bunch of floating barges for solar power. Land is so valuable that they don't want to use land. Well, fortunately in Singapore, the sun is right up there on March the 21st and September the 21st. Norus in Persian and summer harvest, uh, fall harvest festival in England. So uh, the sun is right overhead because Singapore is almost exactly on the equator, just one and a half degrees off. And this happens to be in Orlando, Florida, but Singapore is doing a lot of research and they have four or five of these uh, already working and, and looking at it. You can look at them on the web. I chose the Orlando one because I like the picture a little bit better than the ones I got from Singapore. Uh, so here we are, Singapore, and uh, the airport's over here, and this is very densely populated, but this part of Singapore has been deliberately kept low population and industrially oriented by the government. That channel that you see up there in the northwest is a very good channel protected from the winds so that it does not develop huge waves. Waves are important. Huge waves will kill barges with solar panels. So you want to have protection from huge waves. So the idea is, and by the way, this is completely serious, and I'm involved in discussing the compressed air energy storage with them at this stage. Arrays of solar barges in that protected waterway, and remember that that side of the island is deliberately kept un un a low population because of uh, uh, it's fostering military and industrial things there. And case compressed air well bore arrays, each site may be having, we don't know, the numbers are not known yet, but maybe five or 10 or 12 well bores. Okay. Now, in Singapore as well as New Delhi, you know, I, I, I talked about New Delhi's pollution in air cars, but in Singapore, the distances are quite small. So maybe the Tata air taxi, that's actually a Tata engineering in India, and they have a little taxi on the top. It turns out that a taxi, a little taxi like this, can go to a compressed air uh, storage uh, outlet in a service station and plug in, and in three minutes be recharged. In other words, about the same time as for you to fill the tank full of gasoline. So it becomes socially and technically feasible to actually have taxi fleets. Now you'll only have about an 80 kilometer range or 70 kilometer range on each fill, but then with lots of local filling stations. So when we go back to that compressed air energy storage system that I drew earlier, well, there's an another, there, that's why I put a car there to, to say that there are different uses. So, the solution for the irregularity of wind, uh, solar as well, but I've focused on wind, to try to meet this grid demand with a stable base load with this kind of power uh, irregularity, it's really tough. But you can do it if you pass that power, not all of it, only the irregular part of it, about 30% or 40%, through a compressed air energy storage facility, because at the other end it comes out Smooth, controllable, frequency controlled, voltage controlled. So it's good for the grid. So we can do that. And like I said, the little bit of an excess power here, maybe we can uh, use that as well. What is the alternative that we're doing in Ontario right now? Well, when we generate too much power, we give it away to Michigan at peanuts. We're subsidizing the state of Michigan to the tune of $1.4 billion a year in terms of the energy that we sell to them at very low rates. $1.4 billion a year, or let's round it out to $1 billion a year. $1 billion a year could build you a 350 megawatt compressed air energy storage facility every year with that amount of money. Okay. Every year. Instead, we're giving away value. So then, you would, of course, eliminate the irregularities. So a big strength of the compressed air energy storage is not only load shifting and all these kind of things, it's also smoothing out crappy energy into quality energy. 
So I'm almost near the end of my political spiel. And I'm going to just review with grid scale uh, compressed air energy storage. Uh, it has huge positive benefits, and we know those, and we can run the numbers. But big power utilities are very, very conservative. In Ontario, the business model seems to consist of, well, let's ask for a rate increase. And that's a pretty stupid business model overall, OK? But things are slowly changing. CASE can reduce the need for more natural gas plants, because natural gas plants serve a very similar function to CASE, providing power on demand when you're ramping up or turning themselves gradually off when you're ramping down. Reducing the need for more base load. If you have sufficient compressed air energy storage, you can, what we, you can do something that we call emulating base load. And that's the discussion that we're having with Saskatchewan right now. They want to know how compressed air energy storage can emulate base load. Facilitating renewable power integration. Most grids start to have problems with renewable power, if they have no storage, when they get to about 20% input. Well, if you are storing it and smoothing it out and making it into high quality power, like is possible in CAES, then you can factor in much, much higher percentage of renewables into your grid, and I'm speaking of 40, 50, 60%. You can reduce greenhouse gas emissions accordingly, of course, uh, and uh, other uh, waste issues that might be associated with uh, other types of, of uh, grid scale energy provision. Because you can ramp up compressed air energy power quickly and ramp it down fairly quickly, like in the space of minutes, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, minute, couple of minutes, those kind of time scales. You can ramp up in the morning when people wake up and turn on the electrical kettle, and then ramp down at 9 o'clock, and then ramp up again. So you can meet those other kinds of grid needs. Those are called ancillary services. Uh, well, that's one type of ancillary service. And of course, uh, reducing environmental impacts that are associated with, for example, pumped hydro or battery storage. So the time is now for Ontario to move towards grid scale CAES. There is a confluence of a whole bunch of things. Good geology, dropping cost of wind power, kind of not so fast dropping cost of batteries, wind power, uh, pardon me, compressed air energy storage, environmentally very, very neutral, whereas batteries and pumped hydro, not so much. At the small scale, at, that, at this wellbore storage uh, scale, it also seems to have huge positive benefits because now we can start to do things like, and by the way, we're having these discussions in Australia right now. Australia is in some sense similar to Canada. We ha it has a populated fringe and a huge empty interior. Well, we have a populated fringe along the 49th parallel in, in southern Ontario, and then at a Wapiscot, you know, there's no road up there, Moosonee, et cetera. So we have, we have very isolated communities all the way across northern Canada, servicing several hundred thousand people or more, maybe three, four hundred thousand people, when you include northern Saskatchewan and northern Manitoba, northern Quebec. Putting in transmission lines is too expensive, so all of those run on diesel. 100% of them run on diesel. Sorry. In the Mackenzie Valley, there's a couple that run on a natural gas well. Uh, Tokta Yaktok, I believe, has a natural gas well that they use. We can allow microgrids to be more flexible now. So because we can store energy and use it to uh, facilitate the microgrid operation. Increase the use of waste heat. If we have a waste heat source, and we can pass that cold air during the expansion phase through the waste heat source to heat it up, we're extracting energy from that waste heat even if it's not too high-grade heat. Uh, subdivisions or factories at the scale of uh, needing a few megawatts, you know, two, four, six, eight megawatts of power for a limited amount of time. Uh, they can independently manage their power needs uh, and factor in renewables uh, at their own choice, at their own time and uh, location scale, because uh, the compressed air energy storage uh, well bores have that kind of modular flexibility. And of course, factoring in more renewables. And the time is now to consider uh, megawatt scale. That's small scale, by the way. Megawatt scale compressed air energy storage for your local needs. So the message that the politician finally says to you is vote for me. So vote for case. OK, and uh, with that, uh, and by the way, I find this extremely annoying 
this pulsing yellow thing, so I'm going to leave it on until you're complete. No. Ten seconds is about all I can look at that, all right? So I'm going to put on something a little bit uh, milder there. Okay. So thank you for listening. Uh, it might not surprise you to believe that I'm a case a advocate, but I'm also a case researcher, so we're trying to help find ways of making it more efficient and, uh, and, and more suitable and more flexible. So we uh, will take questions, yes. First of all, thank you for your impressive and very informative presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, the, uh, the capability of seasonal storage for the compressed air uh, storage system. You know, because uh, one of the issues of the renewable energy uh, variation is, is it is not just because of one day or two days, because it's seasonal or we, uh, we want to plan for futures or maybe 50 years and then we need the seasonal storage capability. Very interesting question because the other big area of my research happens to be geothermal and uh, Geothermal may be the only one of these energy storage uh, systems where we can actually store energy seasonally at commercially reasonable rates. Okay? We're doing it already. Canada's largest uh, geothermal, shallow geothermal company is called Geosource Energy. And uh, Stan Rietzma is a graduate of geological engineering at uh, the University of Waterloo. Yay. And he became a professor in, in, uh, in Windsor, University of Windsor, and then quit to start this geothermal company. Uh, he got his PhD, I think, from Toronto or, or London or something. So Stan wants to go deeper and cheaper and faster and, and safer. In drilling well bores, in arrays, maybe 100, 200 well bores, Armagon is studying a case of 180 well bores right now. Is that right? Well, I'm 181, my apologies. <laughs> uh, where we're trying to look at how these well bores can be used to put heat into the ground and then extract that energy, if, if nothing else, at least for home heating, on a seasonal basis. The trouble with CASE, and this is one of its limitations that I tried to emphasize, is that it's high capital cost. So storing energy for more than a few days, the economics are really shaky. And you might, of course, look at me and say very convincingly, but it's very green. <laughs> you know, no matter how green you think, green doesn't cut it when you go and talk to Quebec Hydro. If you can promise them power at one quarter of one cent per kilowatt hour cheaper and promise that, then they'll talk to you. So it's got to be cheaper. And you think new technology is going to be adopted just because it's greener? Mm. Our economy does not work that way yet. It doesn't work that way. So your question is super, but seasonal energy storage for compressed air energy storage is not on. We, this is too expensive capital, capital cost. Yeah. Did you have an ancillary question? I'll try to keep my answers shorter. <laughs> About the levelized cost of... Oh, sorry. About the levelized cost of, uh, I mean, compressed energy, I mean. Good. Good question. I didn't talk about cost. You know, research academic types don't talk about cost too much, except the cost of graduate students, but anyway, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, right now, uh, right now, compressed air energy storage at the small scale that I talked to you about, the company that is trying to uh, do that is talking about 350 less than 350 per kilowatt hour uh, for, the, for the facility, whereas batteries are running closer to 1500 to 2000 dollars per kilowatt hour. Okay? Compressed air, sorry, pow, uh, pumped hydro about 300, 250 per kilowatt hour, right? But remember, in pumped hydro you have to have a place to do it, and Singapore doesn't have a place to do it, for, for example. And then the fourth grid scale option, hydrogen to power to hydrogen, we are nowhere near having that technology operate at the grid scale yet. We're maybe 20 years away from that. Jatin? We can speculate. Yeah. Uh, 20, 30 years away? I mean, that's going to be uh, for you know, my grandchildren, not me. So we really only have three commercial possibilities. Pumped hydro, compressed air energy storage. No, I'm sorry, we have four. Batteries and? The one I mentioned, geothermal heat storage. 
And in order to make decisions, we have to understand more about each one, the efficiencies, cycle time, energy losses, etc. But geothermal energy is another talk, and I'll give that maybe next term and show you how geothermal energy can fit into our grid, but in a different way from CAES. Yeah. Uh, Maurice, thanks very much. Um, just occurred to me, with the smaller scale, could we use existing case wells? <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the locations aren't the best? See that guy behind you here, my graduate student? He's working with a group in Calgary, and he sent me an email two days ago. He says, Maurice, he says, because he's working on orphan wells. You yeah. heard of the, okay, he, yeah. And he said, Maurice, can we use orphan wells for compressed air energy storage? My answer was, was good idea, but you better make sure that the well bore is, and the casing is, is appropriately, you know, it, it can't be in rough shape. So the answer is, yeah, sure. Problem, though, is that in an oil field or a gas field, you might have a square kilometer in one here, one here, one here, one here. So it yeah, tends to be a bit spread out. Your array is, your array is your array. yeah, yeah. And you, there's another reason for that, because if you can have a close packed array, your heat losses are less. Because remember, you're, you're putting air down that's hot, not super hot, but hot, and you want that air to come back hot. But if you have wells that are far apart in small diameter, you start to reach the, you start to hit the brick wall. But your question is well posed. The answer is yes, but we don't know the economics yet. Thank you very much for your informative uh, presentation. I, I've got a question regarding the uh, well case uh, pressure vessel that you talk about. What's the maximum design pressure for those uh, pressure vessels? And also, price-wise, do you have any comparison between the normal ones and, for example, per uh, cubic meter? We can generate all those numbers. I do not have them at my fingertips, but I can give you a reasonable estimate. A vertical well one kilometer deep in Sarnia, for example, would cost, le uh, cased and cemented and ready to go, would cost less than a million dollars, okay? A deeper one, remember that costs of drilling go up exponentially with depth. So if you say to me, well, let's drill a 10 kilometer well, it's not gonna be 10 million, it will be 100 million. Okay, so there is an optimum in here somewhere. It might be better to drill two 500 meter deep wells, than, or three of them, than one 1.5 kilometer wells, depending where you are. Now, because the wells are not dependent on geology, we might be drilling in granite. And in the last 10 years, there's been a very, very substantial improvement in drilling rates in granite based upon compressed, yes, you heard me right, compressed air hammer drilling. So, so you have compressed air and a hammer down at the bottom of the hole, and it's going boom, 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 very, very quickly. And all of the drill chips are being swept up another pipe, because it's a double wall pipe, uh, to the surface. And that can achieve penetration rates that are quite astounding. I mean, 10 times what rotary drilling can achieve in, in shales and uh, softer rock. And that technology is just emerging. But the world's largest geothermal drilling rig right now, with strata energy that can drill down 8.5 kilometers, uses hammer drilling and air circulation, or hammer drilling and water circulation. So those costs are dropping. Now, people often make specious and somewhat idiotic economic comparisons. They say, oh, batteries are dropping in price. Right, but compressed air energy facilities will also drop in price once we start building them, because there will be competition. And those compressors will not cost, uh, what, $1.1 million. If there's a demand for 1,000 of them every year, you can be darn sure that some company is going to be making them for $600,000, probably some company in China. What about the maximum pressure? Ah, maximum pressure. Uh, we drill oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico down to 25,000 feet, which is uh, eight and a half kilometers, I guess. And the pressure that we have to have a control of at the surface is equal to close to 100 megapascals. We have the technology for off-the-shelf, well-designed, for 100 megapascals. I'm not saying that that's what we would use in a facility. 
Uh, we're looking at what, 30, 40 megapascals? Up to 50. That's kind of the range that we're looking at for Singapore, okay? But the technology is off the shelf for 100 megapascals, courtesy of very, very deep natural gas drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, yeah. It's like standard oil field technology. All right, thank you very much for uh, coming and listening and for a series of remarkably good questions. I really appreciate it. Keeps me thinking. Thank you. Thank you.